Welcome to the Lights Out Podcast. This is Chris Lights Out Lytle, and this is our journey to document the history of mixed martial arts. I have brought with me my friend, the MMA detective Mike Davis, and together we will preserve the history and hear some great stories from the world in the era of the no-holes ball. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back to the Lights Out MMA History Podcast. I am Joey Venti. With me as always, host of the show, the MMA detective Mike Davis. Our guest today has been a fixture of MMA since day one. The UFC's first ever manager slash hype man turned Nevada State boxing inspector. He's been backstage, he's been cage side, and today he's here to share his experiences with our audience. My Italian brother, the one and only Charlie Anzalone. Thank you for hey. being here. <laughs> Great to be here. So, Charlie, you uh, have a storied past, so to say, yeah. spreading across multiple countries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're uh, this month of October. We're what we're doing is we're we're talking about UFC one. It's participants. Uh, yeah. Kevin Rozier was somebody that you had managed. You were in oh, his yeah. corner that night. And uh, we're going to talk about Kevin Rozier and UFC one in particular. And then from there, we're going to address a, a various other subjects. So let's talk okay. about UFC one. How did you find out about it? I knew Kevin Rozier when he was 18 years old. He worked, he was a doorman in a nightclub I DJed at. I was a Hall of Fame DJ for like <laughs> three decades. Anyway, you now he told me, you know, I want, I'm not going to take karate. Uh, I want to be a kickboxer. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I hadn't seen him for a couple of years. This is in the 80s. And uh, next thing you know, he became a kickboxer and won like five. ISKA uh, and uh, WKA North American and World Full Contact Super Heavyweight Kickboxing Championships. I said, wow, you know. So then we, we lost track again. You know, he came back to Buffalo for a while. Well, he went around, he went around the horn, boy. He was in New York. He was in New Orleans. Uh, he was in Las Vegas. And, of course, uh, he got in trouble at all three <laughs> for various stupid things. But I hadn't seen him. He was like a 230-pound terror when he was the uh, full-contact heavyweight kickboxing champion. So I haven't seen him in about five years. So I'm DJing one night. I get a knock on my door in my DJ booth. I open up the door. There's a big, smiling Kevin Rozier who I haven't seen in years. And he was about a 285-pound Kevin Rozier. Because I want you to manage me. I want you to help me out again. I, I want you to get me in this event. I got a guy's phone number. He goes, it's it's crazy. It's no rules. You can get killed. You can do everything. What are you talking about? Give me the guy's phone number. So I call his phone number. I answer the phone. He goes, I'm Art Davey. He goes, uh, are you the one that has this crazy new event? Kevin Rozier told me about. He goes, yeah, I'm looking for eight guys for an eight-man tournament. And um, uh, looking for various disciplines and fighters that, would want to do this. You got to fight three times in one night to win a whole thing. And it was $50,000 first prize. And um, it's a, you know, a tournament. I said, well, I got a five time super heavyweight kickboxing champion. He was a North American, the, the ISK blah. I didn't even finish my sales pitch. And I goes, I'll take him. <laughs> and uh, now, now, now how far, how, how far out from the event was this? I was probably a few months. Okay, was I, I'm hearing that Kevin got in about five weeks early, but that, that might be bad information. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe a couple of months. Okay, because that's fair. He, he, hadn't, he, he, he hadn't been training. And, uh, you know, a lot of guys turned it down. Benedict Jetterkitas, Bart Vale, uh, uh, everybody, turned, a lot of guys turned it down. Didn't want to say, what are you, crazy? I don't want to do something like that. But we did it. And um, he came out to... Uh, Las Vegas and trained with Master Toddy for about a week, a couple of weeks. And Master Toddy laughed. He goes, well, Kevin would kickbox, he'd spar, hit the bag. Then he'd sit down and drink water for half an hour. And then he'd get up and do it again. <laughs> he was in no shape. But uh, he had balls. And uh, we uh, boarded the plane and went to Denver, Colorado for UFC 1. He had balls and a good chin. He took some good shots in that first fight. Oh, he was tall. Oh, Zane, Zane Frazier. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was an epic fight. That was one of the most epic fights of all of them. 
it definitely would have got fight of the night if they gave that award back, you know, back then. Yeah. When he was holding out of the cage and stomping on his head, that was epic. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and what happened was we figured, okay, it's an eight man tournament. Other people have to fight here. And, um, go take a break, get some ice, get some on. He's got his hands in some ice and, and, uh, just, you know, chilling out. I got not even 15 minutes later. Char Charlie, Charlie, let's, let's rewind. Right wait, wait, Charlie, let's rewind just a little bit. I apologize. Uh -huh. All right. How far out did you guys get there? Was it a week early? Oh no. Like three days early. Okay. Three, so days. you, you three, got there three days, days early. early. Did they make you do like a public workout? Uh, on that show, I don't remember. I don't think so. Okay. You know, I think I, I think I came there the next, like, two days before. He was there three days before. So Zane Frazier and Art Jimerson both said that in their interviews that the Gracies had, like, Carlos Valente and Big John McCarthy following each of them and, and doing video so they could put send the video back so people could watch it. Yeah, Carlo Valente, the big Carlone. Yeah, he was Gracie's uh, main guy. Did he? Did anybody do that with Kevin Rozier? I don't remember. Not that did I saw. Did anybody come in and demonstrate to Rozier what might happen to him if, like, jujitsu got a hold of him prior not to the while fight? I, not while I was there a couple of days before or nothing. Okay. Let's talk about the rules meeting. Um, oh, the rules yeah. meeting was... <laughs> That was, that was that was funny. Cool. We're, we're at the rules meeting, and they're going over what well, you can't eye gouge, you can't bite, you know, anything goes. You can, and Zane Frazier gets up. He goes, what happens if you lose your mouthpiece? And Horian Gracie stood up and said, tough, protect your teeth. <laughs> and, I just, and I just burst out laughing. You know, your mouthpiece fell out. It's not like boxing. The referee calls time, gets the mouthpiece, and you put it back in, you know. It a legitimate was like, question. That's a legitimate question, actually. Yeah, it, it was. And uh, he got uh, a legitimate answer. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay. <laughs> so do you, do you remember the chaos that ensued with all the arguing? Yeah, you know, there was, um, it, it was, it was a Gracie show. You know, it was a Gracie infomercial is what it was. Okay. And uh, you, you, you could see that. Um, and you knew uh, it then. You figured that out then. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Then what give you that? What give you that impression? Just because Hoist was so famous with his jujitsu, and uh, you know the knowledge of the Valley to do type of thing, and uh, the other guys, you know, a boxer, you know, who you know is going to go to the ground, and you, and that's going to be it. Ken Shamrock, I thought, had a shot because he fought in Pancras. Patrick Smith was a good striker. Gerard Gardeau was a great, you know, sabat kickboxer. And, uh, but uh, Shamrock was the only one that knew how to do anything on the ground if he had to. And, and, and so if you look right, at Shamrock, Shamrock was actually jet lagged because he fought in Pancras less than a week prior. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. He fought in Pancras all the time. And, uh, you know, you wonder how many pancreas fights were works, you know? Oh, which yeah. They, which yeah, a lot we, of, we, a we lot. try to get we try to get that out of him. Uh, we were denied. Oh. He of didn't. Conf I no, no. He didn't confirm <laughs> or deny. He said, I don't want to talk about it. That's yeah. business. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I, I, I know. It was. I sent a guy, my, one of my guys, Joel Sutton, who was an alternate in a couple of UFCs. And he, he booked him in uh, in, uh, in uh, pancreas. I think he fought Fanaki. They come out, you know, like... Fanaki ends up getting him in a no Joel, I think, gets him in a headlock. It's like, come on, Joel. And I saw the tape afterwards. That's you know, he takes Joel down, but puts him in an arm bar or whatever. He said, Oh, what a how fake could that have been? Yeah, Funaki had a bunch of fake events. I, I think the issue with Funaki, and I mean, obviously we're getting off course here. The the issue with Funaki is he was so popular, he had to fight on all of the pancreas events. All of them fighting every month. Otherwise, they wouldn't sell tickets, and because of that, he had a bunch of fake fights. Yeah. That's that's kind of and what I saw. And, and they had the shin pads and the open hand slaps, you know. And right. So, Kevin Rozier, when do you guys find out who your first opponent is? Uh, that that weekend, they uh, they did a drawing, 
and um um uh trying to think of what they did the drawing i can't remember but that but that's when they did they always did a drawing the day before the event really so the rumor was that gerard Gurdeau was Hoyce gracie's first opponent and then they switched it yeah they switched that it uh that i don't remember but i yeah yeah you know, they 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 wanted they wanted to predict the outcome and they did that in more than one ufc they had they had brackets set up UFC three with Harold Howard for existed for example. Uh, we went. We went. Wait, wait, wait. The, we'll get to that. Hey, wait, oh, we're oh, going to okay. get to that. Yeah. Oh no. I, dude, I was dude. just talking about matchups. Okay. Yeah, I've got an entire UFC three breakdown that I got for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So you get Zane Frazier as your first. Right. Zane Frazier, man, he's a hell of a striker. Oh yeah, yeah. He, he was How concerned were you? Fighter. How concerned were you going into that fight? Oh, I thought Kevin had the best shot because he had a chin and Kevin had heavy hands, but he was a Kevin was no shape. Man, he weighed like 285 pounds. He was damn near 300 pounds. But if he could if he could whack the guy, um, he had a shot, you know. I don't want to see him fight a guy that does leg kicks because Kevin didn't do leg kicks, and Gerard Gardeau is a leg kicker. Pat Smith was a more dead leg kicker. So we we had the best chance to get out of the first our our first fight. It was just striker and striker. So with Rozier, uh, what kind of damage did he sustain in that in, in the fight against Saint Frazier? Because it was a war. He he just said sore hands. We went back he in the dressing room. We put his hands in an ice bucket, bucket of ice water. No broken jaw, nothing like that. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. So against his second opponent is uh, Gerdo. Gerard Gerdo. And um, uh, we, uh, you know, Gregor, those hands were sore, too. He had his hands in ice in the dressing room next door. He was pounding the big Hawaiian guy, I think it was, on the <laughs> and Taylor Tooley. Uh, yeah, Taylor, Taylor Tooley, and his, and his tooth went out through the cage. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, the tooth going out the cage on the slow motion replay was great. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I said, well, Kevin, no, you don't like leg kicks, but because um, he had fought more when he was kick by super heavyweight kickboxing champion over in Japan. They wanted Kevin was a super heavyweight and they wanted him to fight the heavyweight champion. They matched him up against Maurice Smith. And that's a fight Kevin should have never taken because Maurice was a great kickboxer. And when I saw that fight, tapes of that, but I knew Kevin, Kevin wasn't going to stand up, up to anybody's leg kicks. And I knew Gerard Gerdo and his history and he could leg kick. So, well, Kevin, um, you, you got a shot to go after him and try to whack him because he's going to start leg kicking you. And that's exactly what he did. He was leg kicking Kevin like Maury Smith did. Kevin was hopping around and finally went down. And Gerard Gardeau was starting to punch him. And that's when I threw the towel in. His, his, his wife was at ringside. They're going, stop the fight. They're killing my husband. They're killing my husband. I got the towel. I'm, All right. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't going to get up. No. So, yeah, that, that fight went about a minute. We're, we're, did you kind of think that it was going to be a quick one then? You didn't have a lot of confidence in that. No, no. Once he started leg kick, once he, once he would start to leg kick, it was all over. Yeah. Watch, watch the fight with Kevin and uh, Maury Smith. It's on YouTube. Okay. And um, you can see Kevin just hopping around and just, oh, oh shit, you know, and, and that was yeah. Now he was an above, he was a full contact kickboxer above the waist only. Was Gerdo smoking in the locker room in between fights? I don't remember that. Okay, I don't remember hearing that. Kevin Rozier had two fights with Dan Severn. Do you remember those? With Dan Severn, um. Not when I was with them. And yes. in the fight that yeah. Severn fought, uh, you know, on the night uh, Severn fought um, um, Hoist Gracie, that's when the time ran out and the broadcast stopped. It was in what, Oklahoma City or Tulsa, yeah, wherever right. it was. Yeah. yeah that, right. uh, and Kevin fought Joe Charles on that card. And uh, again, he was no shape for that either. But yeah, yeah, Kevin did a couple of fights after after I was involved with him. Okay. And are, did you ever read Art Davies' book? 
Oh, yeah. Oh, half the photos in there are mine. You see my oh. photo credits. My photo credits are most of those photos that I took with my little instant, my cheap camera. That's awesome. What was your opinion of what he said about Kevin? Like, Kevin may have been there with, like, an underage girl. Was that, like, kind of just tongue-in-cheek, or was was, was uh, it pretty direct? Kevin was there with his wife. His wife was there at UFC 1. UFC 4, Kevin picked up some chick, and <laughs> she, wasn't, she wasn't underage, and uh, had her up in his <laughs> hotel room the whole three days. But yeah, I don't. Uh, no, he wasn't with any other age girl. That that okay. Good. Yeah, his wife. Yeah. His wife was there. Yeah, it could have been tongue in cheek. I mean, it, it definitely was mentioned in the book. Um, yeah. There was a rumor that the Gracie family went to find Gerard Gardeau in the hotel afterward. Do you remember hearing anything like that? No. Don't remember that. UFC two. You had Sean. Uh, John Docker, the youngest one ever Docherty. to fight in the UFC. He was 18 years old. Yeah. How, how did you hook in with Sean out of Ohio? Uh, a guy who uh, uh, taught karate in Buffalo, Bill Gallant, who um, trained Kevin. Um, uh, uh, Sean used to work out at his gym for a while, but then uh, Sean ended up uh, uh, actually trained with Kevin. He was training with Kevin for a while. And, uh, you know, he didn't have any place to live. He was from Cuyahoga Falls in, in Ohio, outside of Akron there. And uh, he was almost like homeless, you know. He got out of the service and wasn't doing anything. And um, uh, they turned this young kid on to me. He said, you know, he wants to be in the U.S. I said, well, can he fight? A good-looking kid. He built good. And, you know, and, and that was when they had the 16-man tournament. Yeah. UFC, too. And, um, and and that's how he got in it. And after that, um, he wanted to learn more about MMA and grappling and stuff. So he went and joined the Lions Den, and uh, uh, and fought uh, on a couple of shows for them a couple of times. He trained with Frank Shamrock and them. Yeah, he was part of the Lions Den team after that. So when do you and Art Davy become really close? After UFC one. But we became best of friends. We both liked the fight business. We're both from back east. And he liked my knowledge of the fight business. And I was a pretty candid guy. And he liked that. And, uh, uh, you know, we were both boxing fans. I was involved in boxing, too, at the time. I had just started with that with Roberto Duran's team as a gopher. <laughs> and uh, we, we just hit it off. Well, what happened was, after the first couple of UFCs, I was talking to Art. I, I, he goes, Charlie, I got all these kung fu kooks that were probably sniffing incense out in the out in the woods, and they're calling Art Davy. Oh, Mister Davy, I want to. I would like to test myself in the UFC. And Art would tell him, "Man, I only deal with managers." How about Mister Davy? I don't have a manager. And Art would tell him, "I got a manager for you." <laughs> he gave so many people my phone number. I'm like, geez, Art, what are you sending me these guys for? <laughs> you know? And uh, but, but, but we just became buddies, and we still are today. That's good. That's very, very good. Very good. Oh, uh, and but I'll, when you start talking about UFC three, I'll go back into my friendship with Art Davy after that. You'll really like this one. Perfect. All right. So here, Hicks and Gracie goes and sits down with the UFC brass demanding a million dollars to fight. Yeah. Do you remember, do you remember hearing that? Yeah. He said, if I, Mike Tyson gets a million dollars, I can beat Mike Tyson. Why can't I make a billion dollars, a million dollars. And the father, he just uh, really talked him down. You know, how dare you just put money first instead of the Gracie name, you know, Elio. And uh, yeah. And that's when, uh, he ended up going to a, a, a pride in Japan where he could make that kind of money. So you also were the announcer at Japan Valley Tudo. Two of them. And two of them, right? The first two, correct? Well, actually, three of them. One for Frederico Lapenda, his World Valley Tudo, or World WVC, I think it was called. And we did two shows in one day at the Bay NK Hall. And I had brought Harold Howard there. I had brought Todd Butler there. 
and uh, um, a whole bunch of guys. I mean, we had to do two shows. And our, our, our Federico saw me announcing at the club that I worked at. He goes, I want you to announce my show. Okay. And uh, I announced big concerts and shows back home in Buffalo. And I was a WKA promoter myself. And I used to announce my own shows. I did uh, 11 successful WKA uh, uh, Pro-Am kickboxing shows. And um, so I did his shows in Japan. And uh, Mr. Sakamoto, Shudo was there, of mm -hmm. course. And uh, my, my two of my best friends in Japan, Susumu Nagao, famous photographer, and Manabu Takashima, who was a journalist, uh, told um, um, Mr. Sakamoto, he should have Charlie-san announce your event. So they contacted me and they go, we want you to announce our Valley Tudo. So what I did, I would book fighters and announce at the same time. <laughs> the, one, the one Valley Tudo, I had John Lewis against Roman Asado too. Wow. And uh, uh, I, we'd go there with the raw team with Rico Ciaparelli and everybody, you know, Randy Couture and all that. So wow. they invited me to do their Valley Tudo. So what, what the, they did it every year in Japan. It was at the Bay, Bay NK Hall in Tokyo. And that's when uh, I announced the Valley to Do and Frank Shamrock fought Ensign in a way. Oh, that's a great one. Fight. That's a uh, Hall of I, Fame fight. I was the announcer. Oh, yeah. And I announced the uh, the card with uh, uh, Ensign in a way against Randy Couture. When he armbarred Randy and Randy was still the UFC champion. Oh, the UFC was pissed. <laughs> and after the fight, what happened was I would bring them to the ring and it wasn't a cage back then. I would bring him to the ring in English. And then Daiki, the regular Shudo announcer, would announce it in J Japanese as, uh, uh, you know, in, in the ring. And, and um, I mean, after after that Randy Couture fight, Randy walks by me and he, I look at him, I got the microphone, I say to myself, well, Marowitz is going to be pissed. And he walked by me and he went, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh uh, oh, that, those are fun times. We all go with a group of us you know, to Shudo. Okay. Okay. And uh, uh, they treat us so well. Yeah, Shudo was the only legitimate event over there. They had their own commission. And they weren't backed by the Yakuza. They couple, had a couple of guys that helped finance them, but they were there were no uh, Yakuza-owned uh, operation. Straight up and up. So with Hicks and Gracie refusing, like essentially kind of pricing himself out of UFC 3. Oh, of course. He also wound up over with Japan Valley Tudo when you were announcing. What were those paydays like for him, do you think? Well, he, he, he did. I didn't do the Valley Tudo that he was on. He was on other Valley Tudos, not the two that I did. And, uh, oh, and, but for instance, John Lewis got for Sato to just what, 1980 or 1998? You're looking at, yeah. You're looking at, yeah, 96, yeah. He got, this, uh, I had to squeeze a couple more grand out of him, got like fifteen, seventeen thousand dollars 17000 Cash. That's a nice, that's a nice oh. payday. That's Cash. a nice payday. They came to your rooms with that manila envelope. They'd send the girl stacks, $100 bills. Cash, cash, cash. So, well, the only problem with this is you can't bring more than $10,000 back into the States with you. And Ken Shamrock told me what he used to do is he had a bank account in Japan. Every time he went to Japan, he would take money out of his bank account when he went to the Pancrase shows and give five, six thousand dollars to each one of his fighters to take back with him. So we split the money up there before we came back home. We got through custom beer. John, here's your money. Give me my 10, 15 percent, you know, <laughs> cash, huh. cash. No, yeah. you can't beat you can't beat that. No. Right. UFC three. This <laughs> we got we got we got a slow walk this man oh. ufc3 took place on uh september 9th 1994 uh -huh. the opening opening bout was hoist in chemo uh, when he came out when he that when he came out with the crucifix i think right with the big cross oh, yes yeah. with the cross with joe son and i was like you know God, these guys are putting out a show here that was a hell of a fight i mean and chemo really lumped up voice a bit you know did you hear about a double cross involving joe son paying this guy robert ziegler to take private lessons with uh hickson and 
come back and teach chemo everything you learned? No, I didn't hear that. I didn't know anything okay. about that. Okay. But, uh, and again, uh, my karate friend, Bill Gallant, um, said, I got a guy for the UFC for it. He's from Canada. Uh, he's a Brazil Canadian jiu-jitsu champion and uh, karate champion and, and whatever. His name's Harold Howard. He's done a lot of movie work. He was in uh, Gladiator Cop and Lorenzo Lamas. TC, he fought Billy Blanks in TC 2000. Did a lot of stunt work in karate movies. So, okay, so I met him. He's up in Niagara Falls, New York, you know. And uh, got together with him. You want to be in the UFC? Okay. So, again, I I call my friend Art Davey. Art Oh, I got a good one this time. I said, Harold Howard. I sent him a picture of Harold. He had the look. You know, Harold just had that look. Oh, I, I don't. I, oh, he's a good one. We'll put him in the eight man. And um, so, um, uh, when we got there, uh, Art did a private meeting with all the fighters in his office. Harold walks in, and Art just loved them. Because oh, boy, I hope he can fight because he looks so good. He, he looks. He's got that. Luck a mullet was he was he always like in a uh, a white t shirt with no sleeves on? Oh it? yeah, like, hey, Haynes t shirt with his karate pants on. Oh yeah, oh. that was twenty four seven. That's how he was dressed. No, but when he worked out a lot and stuff. Okay, uh, yeah, I just, I hope he was. Uh, what That's a yeah. what a wonderful <laughs> what a wonderful honest guy. And uh, so they filmed the workout for everybody. So we went to this guy's gym where everybody went to work out and they filmed them, you know. And uh, that's when he had that quote. We got a saying back home. If you're coming on, come on. Come on. The best quote ever. Uh, I remember Tito Ortiz told me, he goes, that was the best quote ever in the UFC. If you're coming that, might, on, come that, on. Might, that might be a future Lights Out Podcast t-shirt. I, that's all I'm saying. Oh, so that's good. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I want one. I'll buy one. Uh -huh. So anyway, he goes, Charlie, eh? uh, we got to get a bag of cement. He wanted me a sack of cement. He goes, I don't hit a punching bag. I hit a bag of cement. So he went to Lowe's, got a 50-pound bag of sacre, and we wrapped it up with duct tape. I said, Harold, are you sure you want to hit this bag before you fight? A, a bag of 50 pounds out of a bag of sacre. So he goes, that's what I always do. So he wrapped his hands in duct tape. And they're filming, bam, 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 punched a hole right through the bag of sacre. And when you watch it, and all of a sudden, boom, it just emptied out, went all over the guy's gym floor. And Harold, I'm oh, sorry, eh? Yeah. <laughs> we had to sweep it up and everything. 50 pound bag of sacre we bought. You're telling me that was legit. That was, I just told you, it was legit. Really? That's I was crazy. worried it was going to hurt his hands. I said, you're going to break your knuckles or hurt your fucking hands. What are you crazy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bam, bam, bam. I mean, I wrapped that thing up. Yeah, he, I didn't want it to break he, open the guy's gym floor, you know? You know, he, he does it at home all the time. You know, he's sweeping yeah. up 50 pounds of concrete. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he hits bags of sacre, concrete. He doesn't hit bags. Crazy so, Canadian. Harold Howard, when do you guys get the draw in regards to uh, who your first opponent was? Um, we went to the, uh, I got the, I got the photos of that press conference too. Um, it was the, the day before the fight, like usually. And uh, we go in to the ballroom and all the fighters are sitting at a table and Art's in the middle. I think it was Art Horry. Art was in the middle. And they got the brackets drawn up on the wall. A big, and we look. They already have Ken Shamrock and Hoist Gracie in opposite brackets. I was like, uh, what's going on here? Yeah. Again, they wanted to try to, they wanted to do the best they could to get the fight they wanted for the final. But of course, that's like that's bullshit. Never happens. Yeah. So before they did the drawing, Harold Howard gets up in front of everybody. I, I'm looking at the brackets on the wall, and uh, no disrespect to Master Gracie, but Ken Shamrock already has one loss against Ray Gracie, and all of us have none. <laughs> so why is he <laughs> up there, and we're not? You know, it, yeah, they, and uh, 
and people were, and I got up. Yeah, you know, I don't like the way that's being done. And blah 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 blah. And it just caused the whole fucking commotion. So they end up doing the drawing. After the drawing, Art David comes up to me. Charlie ends alone. The manager I know the best and trust the most. How could you do this to me? I'm not happy. Fix it. I said, what am I going to fix? The drawing's already done. You did it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And uh, and uh, Ken only wanted to fight uh, Hoist Gracie, you know, since he lost. So, so Her- Harold wins his first fight. Against He's- Roland Payne. Against Roland Payne. That was an epic knockout. That should be on the UFC's greatest knockouts. You know what? There's actually something at his next fight that I think should be in the UFC record books as well, on top of that. So Hoist Gracie fights Chemo. He gets lumped up. We talked about it. The next fight, we've got Hoist Gracie versus Harold Howard. Was there any rumors in the locker room in regards to Hoist being banged up? No. No. But I don't know if he was dehydrated or whatever. I mean, uh, they thought it would be great to fight Harold Howard. But, you know, he was, he was just like, they came out to the cage, you know. and So no, 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 no idea. No words. No idea. No... We were like, what the hell? Well, well let me ask and... you a question now. Do you think that had it been the opposite, had Harold had a hurt hand or a hurt rib, do you think somebody would have ran back and told their locker room that people were hurt? Well, in that UFC, oh, yeah. after that knockout with Roland Payne, we walked back to the uh, dressing room Locked. after. Dressing room. Uh-huh. That's when I had my red tuxedo jacket. And I was yeah. in Ted and amazing the crowd. And I thought, some oh, people be throwing popcorn at me and shit. And I'm like, yeah, fuck you. You know? And uh, all of a sudden, bang, Harold Howard's on the ground. So what the fuck happened? I thought somebody hit him with a bottle or something. Well, what happened was, when you walked out to the cage from the dressing room, there were these big colored lights and the fog machine going out that you walk through, you know? And Harold, we're going back to the dressing room, and he didn't see these big light cans going up and down. He went, boom. Right into it, hit and the head. line director and the line director is sitting there, took his headphones off like, "Oh my god, you gotta be fucking kidding me!" <laughs> and I go, "Fuck, did somebody hit?" And I'm looking. He hit his head on these lights because Harold was a big guy, and here's these big round lights. Colored was lights he out up. or was it was it just yeah. bang? But he was, he was like, knocked hey. out, like knocked he out. Was, he was dazed. Yeah. He's like, what the fuck, eh? <laughs> I go, you all right? We go back to the dressing room. And Michael Pilot, the producer, came back. And uh, um, they said, um, you know, well, if Harold can't fight now. We have to put one of the alternates in. No, I'm going to fight, eh? I'm going to fight. I'm going to fight. 50 grand, eh? You know? And, uh, you know, when, when, when Hoyce had threw in the towel, uh, well, 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 here they announce your guys out. You guys are walking out. Like, how how messed up was Harold Howard? Like, prior was he recuperated by the time they he walked out to the yeah, ring? Yeah, but he was still sore and his neck was jammed. If you watch him walk out, he's got a towel wrapped around his neck and he's walking out to the cage like this. When you That's watch the right. replay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. reason. Uh huh. I thought he was just trying to stay warm. No, he's trying to fucking keep his neck from. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. I so was you guys go into the ring. It's okay, so so Charlie, you're gonna have to walk us through this very slow. This is my favorite UFC fight ever. <laughs> go ahead. What happens? They make the announcement. Uh, we, uh, they make the announcement that Hoist can't fight. Was that you when say they, that? Wait, wait. They say that on a speaker, or when? When do you hear that? When we are in the in, the, in in the cage, they had already come to the cage. The crazies and Helio threw the towel. No, we're not going. You know? Okay, but but you were like Harold Howard's name was was called. I, 
uh, Hoist Gracie's name was called, and the bell rang, right or wrong? No. No bell? They might have rang the bell, and, and but what, what happened was, yeah, yeah, because yeah, they rang the bell. Threw in the towel. So technically, he lost. He threw in the towel because the bell had rang. And the producer, Michael Pilot, goes, or Art Davy goes, Harold's got a Harold's got to fight an alternate. Oh no. That's about no, that's he about in, he threw in the towel. The technically he lost. Yep. You know, he should have stayed Thank in the dressing room. And Art was really kind of pissed. But Michael Pilot goes, the producer. Hoist Gracie throws in the towel. He loses. Harold Howard goes on to the final. Let me, let me tell you said, something. He, he Harold Howard's very lucky he had a manager like yourself because somebody yeah. else could have got bullied into an additional fight, even though that was it. I was going to like Charlie. What's it like being the corner of the fastest UFC stoppage ever? Oh, yeah, it's uh... <laughs> that's a record. Uh... That's the record. Never mind Jorge Maslow, Ben Askren. It's Harold Howard over Hoist Gracie. Absolutely. Yeah, when you think about it, yeah. I never that thought mullet, of it that way. That mullet scared the shit out of Gracie. <laughs> but uh, you can, and you can see Hoist was kind of look at he was dehydrated. He was he was no shape to fight after chemo. He had a tussle with chemo. He got he got his bell rung a few times. Can you imagine if Harold would have connected with oh. with Hoist? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Can you imagine? It would have happened. Harold could hit. Yeah. And but they were in the ring and they they threw in the towel. When you throw in the towel, bell or not, you came out to the ring. You were ready to Thank fight. You. you threw in the towel, you <laughs> lost the fight. And I said, no way we're gonna fight a, a an alternate now. You know? Nope. Nope. And, and Joey, uh, Joey, that's our clip. You know, I've been, <laughs> justice. I've been, sir, I, justice for Harold justice Howard. For Absolutely. And Michael Pilot, the director, sided with me. He told Art, nope, vice through in the towel. Harold Howard goes to the final because I was up in my old antics with my red tuxedo jacket. Yeah. And, <laughs> Okay, oh, and, uh, shirtless, shirtless tuxedo jacket. Yeah, yeah, come on. You know, I got that idea. Remember the boxing promoter, Butch Lewis? Absolutely. Oh, he said the black tux, no shirt on, the bow tie. Yep. I said, oh, I got to do that. <laughs> I got to do a did, little, uh, I got to promote myself here. This is my opportunity. And John did, did, Milius, <clears throat> the creative director of the show, you know who John Milius is. Of course, yeah, Conan. The Conan, the, the octagon, predator, you know, uh, Apocalypse Now, he was the scream, script doctor for that. He said, Charlie created the first character of the UFC. He's the evil manager that everybody hates. He goes, it's beautiful. I love this, he said. But Michael Pilot sided with me. I said, no, no, we're not running. No, no, throw in the towel. Throw in the towel. And I, heard, I heard Michael Pilot said, there's no justice if it's just us. Harold Howard goes to the finals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right in back of the dressing room. That's where he, that's where he told Art Davey. Uh, and Art wasn't real happy, but I'm in the, I was. I'm not in it. I'm in it, but I'm not. <laughs> Wait one second. Hey, hey uh, Tyson, you got to mute your mic, buddy. There we go. I got it. There we go. Sorry about that. That was our producer, our the, correct producer, Tyson Green. The story Michael, from Michael, Michael, Michael Pilot told his camera crew, we're going to go into the final. And Ken Shamrock pulled out because after he fought Felix Mitchell, because he didn't want to fight. He said, oh, he injured his leg or injured some bullshit. He didn't want to fight unless he could fight Hoist Gracie, period. When, when did you hear Shamrock wasn't going to go out of the finals? Before we went out. Before when you we, guys? You mean like when you guys came out? You mean, okay, when you guys came out of the cage? No, we were, still back in the, we were still back in the dressing room. We thought we were going to have to fight Ken Shamrock. Yeah. You know? And, and uh, that's when he uh, pulled out. Because you know, Hoist lost to us. Felix Mitchell lost to Ken. It's like, man, we gotta fight Ken Shamrock in the final here. And that's when he pulled out. He said, Oh, he hurt his leg. If you look, like Felix Mitchell kept kneeing him in the leg, kneeing him, kneeing him, kneeing him, kneeing him, kneeing him in the leg. Yeah, that's a tough fight. 
Yeah, and, and but he just wanted to fight Hoist. Goes well, fucking Hoist not fighting. Fuck, I'm not gonna fight. So and and, they, and, and, and he could tell you different. Come on. So when the towel gets thrown in from Hoist, you uh, run into the ring. I'm stomping around the ring. Ah, oh, we want Hoist. We want crazy. God damn it, you know. And Harold's yeah. like, damn, you know. So it was, it was it was almost like kind of a delayed reaction for me. Yeah. <laughs> You, know? you guys are but, stomping uh, around, pissed off because you guys wanted to fight Hoist. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was pissed and, off. And, 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 and Joey, the Kevin Rozier, Zane Frazier about your favorite moment involving this gentleman. <laughs> My favorite moment is Charlie runs into the ring and throws himself into Kevin Rozier's arms. Jumped Charlie up. gets hoisted yeah. up victoriously. Yes, yeah. that was hey, a WWF wanna, move. You, if if you watch that the interview afterwards. You know, do you know who was interviewing Kevin? Oh. It was his first TV gig. He was a sports guy on radio. Watch oh. UFC. Watch the interview after. What, what was your strategy, Kevin? Let him hit me. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah, of course. That's Brian, yeah. that's Brian Kilomede from Fox and Friends. I, I, Joey's a California guy. No, he no, no. I, I, I know the guy you're talking I, about. I thought he he's I on thought Fox he was in the, no, he's no, on I, Fox I, in the morning. I know. I didn't know he did UFC one. I thought he did three or four. But yeah, he UFC was there for one. UFC one. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, yeah he's he's famous on Fox for sure. Yeah. But yeah. I, basically, we start. I don't oh, no, know. He's, 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 yeah. he's no. He's a Fox News guy. Yeah. Uh, you Brian can Kilmey. name a yeah. huge movie star. I will have not, not, no, 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 yeah. not, not a movie star. Fox News. He's a he's a political commentator. Fox News in the morning. Oh yeah, he's big time. If. Yeah. You were to name a movie star, I gotcha. would have no idea. There we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so Harold Howard goes on to the finals against Dave Bennett, though. Well, he no, he, we had to fight uh, 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 Steve Jenham. Steve Jenham. Steve Jenham. Holy shit, dude! Steve Jenham. Brain and it's like you get Steve Jenham. In- uh, I got. It's like we got to fight a fresh alternate. I said, Harold looks like you could take, take this guy. Well, and Steve then Harold, Jenham, he did look Jenham, like, but Steve Jenham, Harold caught Steve Jenham with several punches. He did. That would have that would have knocked most people out. Yeah, and then they went to the ground. and He flipped him over. He flipped Harold yeah. over. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, and a- after it, uh, Mike. Yeah, Michael Pilot had a camera guy. Just watching me, if Harold wins, keep a camera on Charlie. He's going to jump on top of the cage or do something stupid. We got to have it on camera. God damn it. That would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but you know, we, we like to, like, you know, tease a lot and, and stuff like that. Harold Howard, that guy could punch. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, he, absolutely. He, pain. He, 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 was a, he was a full contact karate guy, too, you know? Yeah, like he he cracked Jenham. Where like I remember watching, like I, I watched it recently, and I, I'm like, man, Jenham's got a good chin. Yeah, he's got yeah. a good chin. Like yeah. most and people would crumble. Then he did that that flip kick thing, you know. He, <laughs> yeah, that was a gamble. <laughs> and it's a gamble, but he, but he missed. But then he, he got up, and then they came together, and I think Harold took him down and I mean, down, she, flipped him over. Just so everybody knows, it's what Datsik landed on Arlo, uh, Andre Arlovsky. Yeah. Oh, years yeah. Years prior. Years Remember prior. that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you guys come in second. Uh-huh. What's the prize money fifth, look like? It was uh, $50,000 for the winner, 15000 for second, U.S. dollars. And, of course, for uh, with the exchange rate, that was almost twenty grand for with almost a thirty percent exchange rate on Canadian money. So wow, Harold made up. Yeah, what was the last time you talked to Harold Howard? I found him on Facebook about a year or two ago. We I can't, we can't get a hold of him. We can't after, get a hold of him after he got in trouble. <laughs> he got in trouble up in Canada, you know. Yeah, he drove his car through a casino. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. some say he parked it really he, he, close to the crab stable. He, he was he was pissed off at the he was pissed off at his ex girlfriend or something, her boyfriend or whatever. And he drove drove a new pickup truck right on the front door of the casino Niagara. 
<laughs> we we would love to let him tell his side of the story. I, I'm oh, sure he's. Oh, oh, oh. A lot of people, uh, a lot of people want to talk, get a hold of him. I if feel any, I, I heard he's in Toronto oh, now, but you might find him on oh, Facebook. He should be on Facebook. If anybody can get a hold of Harold Howard, dude, we've got gifts for you. Free t-shirts. <laughs> okay. And we've got gifts. Uh, if I find him, I'll send him a message. Yeah, a, a lot of people that want to talk to him. He's like a, he had a cult following. Yeah. Yeah. If you're coming Justice. on, come on. Come Justice on. Justice for Harold Howard. Absolutely. And, 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 and breaking the concrete bag on the floor that I had to sweep up. <laughs> Charlie, are, are you aware on his record that the Hoist Gracie fight is a no contest? Say again? On his MMA record, the Hoist Gracie fight is a no contest. Against us. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that's how it's recorded, but he yeah. threw in the towel, and that's when Michael Pilot, the producer, came screaming at our Davy, the towel's in. That when you throw in a towel, I don't care if you're in the ring, out of the ring, or in the hanging from the yeah. rafters, you throw in a towel, you quit. Yep, especially you when you're in the ring. When, the, when that bell rings, that bell rings. Flag. You quit. Yep. So David Isaacs, we had him on. Um, he was the president of the UFC. And he, he towed the company line. We said, do you think it should be? He paused and he said, there was no rules in our rule book in regards to how that should be judged. I'm like, okay, all right, you know, I'm not going to press here. I'm not going to press. You know, you shouldn't be on a jury. Shouldn't be on a jury. But, you know, in any kind of com unarmed combat sport, or even in war, you raise the white flag, you lost, you give up, you surrender. And the white towel is the same thing. Thank you. Agreed. I threw the towel in in UFC one when Kevin when Gerard Gordo was pounding him when his wife was screaming. Are you kidding me? It, it should be a no contest. It should be a no contest. Same with <laughs> you know, the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Reverse all of those towels. Re yeah. re it, reverse them all. <laughs> and, and, and what, what's funny is the UFC in Buffalo. I'm looking at the poster. UFC seven that. I helped get approved. Uh, I got the UFC approved in three states. And two of them with my partner, Les Banano, who was a boxing promoter in New Orleans, uh, with our contacts. Because that's before that's before it was left up to the um, municipalities and not the uh, state commissions. Because state commission didn't have no didn't know anything about MMA. So the UFC, when it went to Buffalo, go, can we get it approved there? I said, yeah. I knew the mayor, Mayor Massiello, a little friend of mine. I used to DJ for all his inaugural balls. My lawyer, Leroy Johnson, who was on a city council, was Rick James's brother. My friend, Andy DiVincenzo, a well-known fish and politician in Buffalo, he was on the council. They voted for it unanimously, and that's how it got into Buffalo. Well, I mean, that's a legendary event with Ken Shamrock and Oleg Tektarov in the uh, finals. Yeah, I had all, I got tickets for all the Buffalo Bills. I had all the Bills at ringside. Jim Kelly, Bruce Smith, everybody. They so used to hang out at my club. I got, man, I got you ringside. You're all going to be ringside. You, you also had uh, Paul Varlins and Marco Huaz in the finals. Marco Huaz. Oh, Mar Marco, but some of the Bills that were, I was in a ring, I was at the cage side. Some of the Bills were all at the cage side. And I go, God damn, look at his trap, his leg muscle. God damn, I, I couldn't get kicked like that. And I'm a, 300 pound offensive lineman. Look at the kicks. God damn. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. You were also at uh, UFC 12, the Buffalo to Dothan, Alabama. No, that was Niagara Falls to Dothan, Alabama. Uh, Niagara Falls. Yeah, Dothan. I apologize. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had Nick Sands on that one. And uh, he fought Jerry Bolander. And he fought this other guy from Mexico. Um, Anyway, the place was sold out. It was uh, in the dead of winter, snowing like crazy, and the UFC got everybody together uh, in a big conference room, ballroom there to make the announcement. Um, the UFC's been banned in New York State uh, in the middle of the night, late night legislation by that asshole Ended up going to jail for embezzlement or whatever he did, that politician, a few years back. Anyway, and that was because of John Peretti. Fucked it up for everybody. 
So wait, let's clarify that. John Pretty was doing an event right around the same time in New York City. You yeah, in Brooklyn, like, the out- yeah, like in Brooklyn or wherever he was doing it. He was going to do it in some armory or something or some yeah. arena. And the and- politicians told him, you know, because they just had a thing in the cover front of the New York Times or Daily News, you know, human cockfights, you know, with a picture out on the front page. And um, they said, you know, I, th- I guess they, you know, they told them, do it in Westchester or Long Island. Don't do it here in Manhattan or Brooklyn or Bronx. Do it kind of outside the city. Too much heat. A lot of bad, pub- bad publicity. Yeah. And he said, well, the state doesn't have any rules for this. So you really can't stop me. I'm going to do this event. Oh, was, was John a little arrogant in your opinion? <laughs> Uh, at that time, he was. Yeah. Hmm. He put a couple of my fighters in uh, in the UFC before we didn't get along anymore. Uh, okay. He put Chuck Liddell in the UFC for me. Well, with, with Peretti, Peretti, in essence, tries to pull off an event in one of the major cities in New York. Well, they come down on him, and by proxy, your event gets canceled. Right. The politicians there... Uh, late night legislation banned uh, uh, no holds barred fighting. No. So take, take take us through when you were told and leaving and getting to Dothan and somehow getting back. <laughs> oh, you know that story? We want okay. to hear from you, though. Yeah, oh, you're saying, oh, yeah. So anyway, it chartered two airplanes. One to carry some of the gear and, and a a lot of the gear and a 757 to carry more of the gear. I mean, the lighting trust, everything had to go. And then I was working for the airlines at the time. Uh, I just retired too. I did 41 years with the airlines. That was my day job. And I had, I was on the tarmac making sure they didn't load what we called restricted articles. I told the guys, you can't put any paint cans, no paint, no flammable stuff inside this airplane. Well, what if we got to paint and touch up the stage, you know, the, you know, the octagon, all that? I said, we'll do it down there, find some paint. But anyway, we had this big 757, and uh, but we had empty seats. So the fans came, you know, fans were all around the hotel because we were going to do a press conference and weigh-ins and stuff and everything when they made the announcement. And uh, so, well, we got like 25 empty seats. And first come, first serve, whoever gets to Niagara Falls Airport, is going to come to us to Dothan, Alabama. <laughs> people were out in the street in the snow, waving down cabbie. People, anybody. They probably, who are these crazy people in the middle of a snowstorm in Niagara Falls? Yeah. Take us to the airport. Take us to the airport. So uh, we ended up taking 25 people down with us. Now, we flew into Birmingham, Alabama. And because uh, Dothan didn't have a runway big enough for a 757. So we, we landed in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. They had a fleet of buses uh, uh, all lined up. And we drove, had to be a three-hour drive down to Dothan, Alabama. Redneck Dothan, Alabama. And so they told us, they had hotel rooms. There's like five of us in a, ho- in a room. Just <laughs> put our stuff down and take a fucking nap. This is the day of the fight. So they told us, bring your bags with you to the to the arena because after the arena we're flying we're getting the hell out of here but we got a plane out of Dothan that'll take off from Dothan so they had advertised it we we always had a, like a redneck promoter always had a backup guy uh, for years it was Buddy Alvin and uh, they had a guy down in Dothan Alabama they had to go in a state where they allowed like cockfights <laughs> and uh, so uh, we uh, um, the the Waffle House did record business there next to the hotel. I mean, it was the busiest the Waffle House ever was. So, did, did, at any point, did you think that this fight would not take place in Niagara Falls? Yeah, until they said we got a plane chartered for tonight, and uh, uh, or for in the morning. And uh, uh, we're going to uh, go to Dothan, Alabama. But, you know, we're not going to be able to sell any tickets. They advertise on a rock station down there. 
said the as you might have heard, the UFC has gotten thrown out of New York State and banned, but we're doing it here in Dothan, Alabama, and the tickets are free. They just wanted people in the arena. Of course. You know, they, they, bought, they bought the pay-per-view time and everything. That's so, the poster. That's the poster to get, by the way. If you guys want to collect the UFC poster, everyone wants UFC one. This is the poster to get. Yeah. Agreed. I got the I still got the credentials, the octagon credentials for really? it. Really? Yes. Oh yeah. Um anyway, uh what happened was we do the fight. Uh, I think Nick beat this Mexican guy. Then he's got to fight Jerry Bolander and him. Jerry Bolander submitted him. And uh, it's like, okay. And, and Elaine, it was either Elaine McCarthy, John McCarthy's wife, or Kathy Kidd, who was the event coordinator at that time. You walk around. Charlie, how many Elaine. people you got with you? How many, Elaine McCarthy, yeah. How, yeah. How, how many people you got with you? Um, there's me, there's Nick, there's a corner man. And um, uh, there's like, I got the guy from uh, Black, Black Belt Magazine of Spain. Well, we only got room for like three of you. <laughs> <laughs> three of us? Wait, what do you mean? We're taking a head count. The plane we got going back is smaller than the one we came down on. My God. Yeah. And so we had just enough seats to take the fighters, the crew, but not the 25 fans that came down with us. Oh. So I was like, oh, thank you for your support. Thank you for supporting being a fan of the UFC, but you got to find your way back to that. We're going to ditch you in Alabama. From Dothan, Alabama. They probably had to take a bust a mobile and get a flight out of there. So can, 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 can you imagine that call home? Hey, hon, no, no. They just left us here. Yeah, no, no. yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, there, there's nobody else. I'm. I, I just. I, I need a, another day or two to get home. <laughs> why are you some money? Yeah, why are you some money in, in the middle of the winter? <laughs> yeah. So we get to the airport. Now, I work for the airlines. I know a lot about airline travel, and uh, it's pouring rain. And uh, it was a military base, but it didn't have a lot of runways, long runways. I saw a lot of helicopters and stuff. <laughs> And so we got on the plane, we turn around on the runway, and I hear the captain throttling up with the brakes on. He's got the brakes on, which a lot of captains do on a shorter runway. They it's like it's like doing a burnout in your car, you know? And uh, I hear those engines throttling up. It was a 727. And the engines are throttling up, the plane's shaking. He lets the brakes go and we start going down the runway. And I go, I don't like this. It was pouring rain. And I'm, and I'm looking at the window. You know, when you're looking out the window, you see the thousand foot markers go by. Yep. Well, there was like, you know, 7,000, 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, 2,000, 3,000, 2,000. I'm like, oh, fuck. And all of a sudden the plane rotated, went up, boom, and there goes a thousand foot marker by the window. I was wow. like, whoa. Yeah, because when I heard that, felt that plane shaking when the captain's got the brakes on, getting ready to release the brakes because he's got to throttle, he's got to go as fast. Yeah, sure yeah, we wow. we left the ground. I was like, oh, yeah. Well, that was That's great. Good. Oh, and, and in Dothan, Alabama, if you uh, if you watch it again, you probably hear it. But uh, who was it? Jeff Blotnick and Bruce Beck. Yes. You know, we are live. They were still plugging shit together. Lights <laughs> and stuff and plugs. But they had to be on pay-per-view because they bought X number of pay-per-view time. They had to start at like 8 or 9 o'clock Eastern time, wherever it was. Live from Dothan, Alabama. It's the UFC. And all you could hear in the back of the crowd, and he had signs. People had signs. New York sucks. New York sucks. <laughs> And they're trying to keep a straight face. Well, you probably heard what happened that uh, MMA or uh, uh, what they call it, the No Holds Barred is banned in New York State. So we've moved down here to Dothan, Alabama, uh, and over in the middle of the night. Yeah. New York sucks. New York sucks. Oh, God, that was funny. They had signs and everything. Because of Rock State. You had mentioned Buddy Albin. What, what was he like? Buddy Albin was a good. Best of buddy of mine. He's still down in Denton, Texas. 
he was there. Uh, he was involved with. Uh, he had a little team with the uh, was Guy Metzger and Anthony Macias. That was his uh, his UFC team originally. You know his guys, and uh, he told him he goes, yeah, "You you need anybody to work on your promotions when you go to other cities? I'll set up the hotels. I'll get it all set up." And uh, he did quite a few of those UFCs. He was also involved with uh, the IFC in Ukraine, March 30th, 1996. You want to laugh? I just happened to have this sitting next to me. Combat in Kiev. Wow. I was the announcer. Yes. Yes, but you I were. I was the announcer by default because I had a guy who wanted to go down there and he and he didn't have a passport. So I... I before I got down there, uh, went to New York, got an Air France flight out of New York to transfer with an Air Ukraine flight out of Paris to Kiev. And Buddy Elvin set that all up. Um, uh, and when I got to Kiev, I thought my friends, we had to, we had to spend the night because our flight to Paris was late. So we had to spend a night in Paris. They paid for the hotel the airline did. And um, uh, we... Um, Got to Kiev. And I go, go oh, see my friend, see your buddy, see who's, who's coming to pick me up. Richard Hurd or one of them guys. Well, I go to the customs guy. He's got this military suit on. Looks on my passport. Goes, fight? Fight? Yeah, I'm here for the fight, the fight. Snaps my passport. So they were waiting for me. So I go, I get my bag. I get my bag, I checked, and I um, brought it to the customs you know they open up your bag whatever before and the guy takes my bag and there's these two young thugs turn out to be really good guys with their black leather jackets i want a sign that said hands along i said oh these are the guys that are picking me up <laughs> so they walked up to the guy that had my bag said something to him they got oh got my bag and ran it out to the car himself and uh i find out later these guys were working for them Ukraine mafia guys that back the show. And Ukraine mob, they run everything there. Uh, GM Ukraine Canada. You didn't get a GM car in there. It went to this guy. And uh, still and do. Yeah. Still do, Charlie. They're cleaning up oh. on our tax dollars right now. But go ahead. They're all, yeah. they're, all, they're, all, they're all putting money in their pockets. They're all getting put millions and millions and millions. Yeah. Now the Ukraine oligarchs are driving their Ferraris and Lamborghinis next door in Poland and shit in Romania. I'm so glad out. it's not going to Hawaii. I'm so glad oh. it's not going to Hawaii. Yeah. That's sarcasm. So let, let's move on. Let's move on before we go down this. So this we get hole. we get a, we get in the car. We get in the car, and uh, okay, I, yeah, you guys don't speak a lot of English, but uh, the hotel, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't get two feet from the curb right here. B b b b b b. And they turn around, looking at me, go, shut. Polizzi, polizzi, and they start laughing. Polizzi, I've been in Ukraine for five minutes. I'm going to be put in a Ukrainian jail. What the fuck? <laughs> polizzi, I'm like, fuck. So they looked in the trunk, looked at the guy's driver's license, let us go. It's about a half an hour drive to the hotel. And uh, I'm like, where are you taking me? <laughs> you know, finally got to the hotel, and uh, all the guys were there, and um, they had a Big banquet. The Ukrainian guys had a big banquet at the stand up bar. It was like it was a night restaurant, discotheque on the first floor, strip club on the second floor, a casino on the third floor. And uh, so I got there late. Everybody sitting down. There's a table of about 30 people, boss rooting, everybody, everybody was there, all the producers and buddy album. And, and, and I uh and I go sit with the young guys who picked me up. No, Sean, you sit with the boss. You sit with the boss. No, I'm sitting with you guys. Oh, they were so happy. They were my, my best buddies for five days. So so this was the event where you guys had to paint over the canvas. Or Buddy you. put a logo on the ring that looked like a UFC logo. And when he did the posters for the fight, he had special guest Muhammad Ali on the posters. <laughs> like he was going to bring Muhammad Ali. Buddy, what the fuck are you doing? But who we brought was was Leon Spinks. And, Very close uh, enough. Very so close. close enough. The, the, guy Leon, the guy who Leon Correct. Spinks fought in the Olympics uh, came down and, and took him out to dinner. 
But uh, yeah, so but they, they were, people would ask, where's Muhammad Ali? Well, well, he wasn't feeling good and couldn't make the trip, so Leon came down with us. I'm like, oh, jeez. <laughs> so, so when you guys painted over the logo, do you think that was Art, Art Davey was also there? Am I correct? No. No. From what I understand, this had nothing to do with it. Ron Van Cleef was. So why did this drive a wedge? I I was told that this was the wedge between Art Davey and the UFC. Yeah, yeah, it was because he was trying to play off the UFC for his own event. And uh, it got back to Art. I don't know how it got back to him that, uh, you know, we're in the fucking Ukraine, that uh, uh, the logo... um, Looked like the UFC logo. And they had to get black paint, and hopefully it would dry by fight time. You know, the day before. So, so was Art involved with this show at all? The match no, no, that was buddies hooked up with some guys from the Ukraine. And Gene Faberkant was one of them. He was uh he's from Brighton Beach in Brooklyn. He used to train fighters and stuff, and uh, and he hooked up with a guy in the Ukraine because they they didn't never did it. Uh, uh, but he wanted to do a show in like Eastern Europe or a communist in Russia or whatever. And nobody had ever done an MMA show in Eastern Europe, you know? So that was uh, Buddy's in. And so with my friends in the Ukraine that'll do it. So why does Art take the fall for this? I don't know. Uh, he had nothing to do with the show. Yeah, but we can agree that this was the wedge. Yeah, yeah. That, it's sort of even Art and SEG and everybody got got pissed off at it because Buddy was our on-site promoter at all the UFCs, you know, in Alabama, Georgia, and shit. He arranged the hotel, you know, in case there was any problem. He had a redneck promoter down there. But yeah, I was like, you're using the likeness of the UFC. I mean, that was Art's baby, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was an Igor Vachenchen. Yeah, oh, coming out part. So, that was so, just... so Buddy goes, Buddy goes, man, we gotta, we gotta, we need a ring announcer. You want a ring announce? Said, I don't have any clothes. I got a track suit and some cold weather clothes. So, Buddy gave me his suit coat to wear, and Ron Van Cleef gave me his tie. And that's what I wore when I ring announced the show. There was no headsets or nothing. So, the producer at ringside, uh, well, Howard Peschler was there. And this other guy, Ned, I forgot his name. He was a sports broadcaster. I had to look at him and barely hear, hear him and read his lips. I just waited for He would say something about a fight. And now back to the ring with our announcer, Charlie Anzalone. And that's when I would, I'd be looking at the camera and announcing. I, I had to watch him, okay? I'm waiting for him to say back. And yeah, it's, it was kind of off the, off, off the cuff kind of event. And uh, that's an eager retention. One is first. Uh, yeah, it's coming up party. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the guy that's got more tournament wins than anybody else in the world, Igor Bovchenshin. This yeah. is his first historic, historic event. Um, first. You get, go ahead. And, the, 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 but, and there was a problem. Oh, well, we, had, we had like too much fun. Uh, Boss I want to hear about it. Paul, Boss Rutten and Paul Verilins had a little too much to drink. Okay. And, and uh, they started scuffling around. They went right through the stained glass door that where the strip club was on the second floor. <laughs> of the oh my god! And, and the bouncers, these big Russian bouncers, got my, and, and this little guy. We called him Joe Pesci. He was a little little Ukrainian guy with a limp. He probably got shot at one time in his life. He was like, no, he can do anything he wants, anything he wants. And Boss Rutten goes up to this big bouncer. Mwah, kisses him right on the cheek because <laughs> boss was in there groping all the girls <laughs> yeah mm. and uh, uh, oh, was, wasn't there issues with the mafia as well not allowing you guys to leave with the film from from well, the what, event? Ha- what, what, what happened was to be honest with you what happened was is that after the fight uh, we're back at the uh, a hotel and uh, Buddy's having a meeting with the Ukrainian guys. They want to know where the money was. Evidently, who was ever working the arena was putting the money in their pocket. And Buddy goes, well, fuck it. It's your, your, technically your event. 
your people work in the door of this arena or whatever, you know, they, they were real short on money. And, uh, but uh, they liked me. All these Ukraine guys, they just loved me. And uh, especially the, uh, what, what, what I would do, oh, when I was announcing, I'm like, you they said, you have to announce these Ukrainian guys. I mean, I can't pronounce their fucking names. How do you pronounce their name? How do you pronounce the name? <laughs> uh, and I wrote it down on a paper, my card. I'm reading it when I'm announcing. I wrote it down phonetically so I could say it, you know? Huh. This is Vladimir so-and-so from Ukraine, General Motors, Ukraine, Canada. And hey, he's at the ringside. You know, he was one of the guys. Nothing gets into can. No car gets into the Ukraine unless it goes through him. And then th there was a... The Ukrainian guy who happened to uh, run the radio station, Radio Kivska Slavostik, and and the newspaper, he would then announce them. Uh, he he would announce them in uh, uh, in oh, Russia. Russia. Yeah, Russia. And uh, this guy was an interesting guy, being from Buffalo. The first ever hockey player to defect to the NHL was Alexander McGillney for the Buffalo Sabers. And uh, this guy comes up to me. You're from Buffalo. I said, yeah. That's what I did. What well, when you go to when you went to the Ukraine back then in Russia, you brought um, stuff to barter with. And I was bringing NHL jerseys with the Russian players' names on. Oh man, I could have got your first child for one of those. And uh he goes, You know Alex McGillney? I said, Yeah, he comes into my club three times a week after the games. I was with Alex when he disappeared. I said, Really? We were playing, I forgot what, Norway or something or whatever. And he goes, we went to the airport to get the plane. No, Alex, he disappeared. Now he's rich, good for him. <laughs> and they smuggled that, smuggled him to Buffalo. There's a whole video on that. It was like a the KGB looking for him and everything. It's on YouTube. It was a scary thing they had. And anyway, he put a picture of me and him on the paper, the newspaper and kid the next day, the two announcers. Hmm. Still got that so, picture. so with uh, with the mafia issue and the tapes, how does it get resolved? Because I know it went on for quite a long time. And Gene Fabricant had his guy in the Ukraine, who was the, like the local promoter of the event. He wasn't a mob guy. He was a guy that did all the logistics work, interpreter, and all that stuff. Had the tape, and Howard Peschler who was the producer of the show, flew back there. That took a lot of balls and met with him, got the tape, because Howard goes, all the work I put into this, I'm not going to leave. I got to get that tape. And uh, they went from, he went from, took the tape. I think he was with Gene Fabricam. They flew from, they went from, they went on a train from Kiev to Odessa and flew out of there. And when they got on the train, they paid the conductors off. Don't tell anybody we're on this train, you know? <laughs> and uh, they got to Odessa, got a plane, got a flight out of Odessa and came back with the tape. It was like, a, you know, they could have been down. Huh? What did it cost they, them? Oh, I have no idea. But uh, he got the tape. And he got it a while later, too. Yeah, he was persistent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he had to. He had to have a guy over there to make the arrangements that he trusted and, you know, not to tell these guys, this guy's coming to get the tape and then have him kidnap him on a train going to Odessa and never see him again. You know? Yeah. It was like a, like a mystery movie thing. <laughs> wow. So right around this time, Art Davey, you know, sees his exit from the UFC. What was that like for yourself? Because I know, obviously you stated earlier that you and Art were very close. Yeah, it was, uh, um, uh, I felt kind of bad, but then I didn't because he they paid him like a couple million dollars. <laughs> well, the reason one of the reasons why he left, he was thinking of doing his own show because it was taken off a of pay per view at that time. Remember, mm -hmm. it was starting to be taken off, and he figured if he could do a show on closed circuit TV at movie theaters like they used to do with the boxing, you know, and. I think it was John McCarthy and Andy Anderson ratted him out to SCG. And that's when they sort of 
Well, I think Big John McCarthy has kind of been proven to have done that. Um, yeah. Andy, do you think Andy was involved as well? I I I I heard he was, and Andy was a dear friend of mine too. Yeah, Andy, Andy, and I texted well, each was, other. Was, yeah, he's yeah, in prison. Was, he's in federal prison still. Yeah. Well, oh, you know what? When I found out he went to federal prison, uh, you know, Art Davy made a couple million dollars and he sold out his share to UFC. You know. So he made out okay. I was hanging around with Robin Leach one night here in Las Vegas, and Robin and Andy are best friends. That's how I met Robin Leach. And I go, you know, Robin, I haven't seen Andy for a while. He goes, Charlie, we won't be seeing Andy for a while. Uh, matter of fact, for about 360 months. <laughs> oh. <laughs> do. Hey, like 30 years for laundering money for some bike gang and stuff. He didn't have to do that. He had very Profitable strip clubs in Dallas, which is which his mother really owned. Yeah. So Andy was also on that uh, that trip out to uh, Ukraine as well, correct? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. now we know how. Oh, they found funny out. story about funny story about that. <laughs> we were going to an event, we were a party, or a casino, mm. or a club. A guy was driving us around in a van, and Boss Rutten had to take a piss. And we got to tell this guy to pull over. Don't go pissing in the van. Boss, pissing in the guy's van because he had to piss so bad. The guy pulled the van over, took the fucking keys and started walking down the street in the middle of the night in the snow, leaving us there. And and they, Andy opened up the door. God damn it, boss. Get out of here if you're going to take a piss. And him and Andy started wrestling around and rolling around in the snowbank. <laughs> <laughs> and we had this girl who was our interpreter pleaded with the guy to come back. The guy was leaving us. He got pissed off, took the keys and fucking left us. Here we are in the middle of the cab in the middle of the night in the snow. Yeah, that was a wild. Oh, and, and we had our pick of any girl we wanted in Kiev. We had really? a girlfriend for five days. Anyone we wanted. I went, that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, uh, uh, Leon Spinks. Be knocking on my door all night. Charlie, where the cocktail at? Where the cocktail at? He drank all the Hennessy in the hotel. I said, Leon, I don't have any more booze, you know? Yeah. They took us to the uh, Holocaust Museum. They gave us a nice tour, Kev. Yeah. The, the World War II and the Holocaust Museum and the Afghan War Museum. Um, man, they, uh, they treated us good. They treated me good. But every day when we went somewhere, they took me by myself. They liked me. Charlie, you come with us. You come with us. I was an Italian guy from New York, you know, <laughs> New York State. And uh, they, 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 they really liked me. But yeah, we had our own, own little girlfriend for the whole week. So let's talk about the transition from uh, Preddy to Art Davey. What was, your, what was your thoughts of him as a matchmaker? Um, You know, it was kind of ironic that he's the one that almost got the UFC out of business when he got it banned in New York. You know, it's like, and they hired the guy. Yeah. We brought that up with David I, yeah. Isaacs too. Yeah. He said they, they had no one else to go. Yeah. And of course there really wasn't anybody at the time, unless they could have got Monty Cox, you know, but, um, he was all right. Uh, I had Francisco Bueno booked for a UFC the night that, I had Chuck Liddell make it. He was supposed to fight Mike, Mark Van Arsdale, and then he pulled his hamstring when he was jogging. So we had to pull out. But uh, I needed a guy for an alternate. So my my best friend and fight partner here, one kick Nick, Nick Blomgren here in Las Vegas, guy, Nick, you got a guy that can punch and kick, that can wrestle a little bit? I need a guy for an alternate. He goes, let me make a couple calls. He goes, I got a guy, a friend of ours. He's an amateur Kempo kickboxer, but he wrestled at Cal Poly for one year. His name's Chuck Liddell. I said, oh, that's good enough for me. Okay. And that's how he got little, for- I, I'd say one kick also was Stefan Bonner's favorite coach. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were kind of heartbroken with that. Stefan was such a good guy, and Nick really so, liked so him. So you met Chuck Liddell through one kick? Yeah. And uh, I got him in the first UFC. Uh, I guess Noe Hernandez. Noe Hernandez at the time was like uh, a two-time Michigan uh, boxer, Golden Glove, Golden Glove yeah. champion. I, I, th- he, I think he was one. Of, I think he was one of Monty Cox's guys too. He was a military right? fighting systems guy. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I remember. Oh, he nailed Chuck with the first punch. Chuck's nose just blown big time. 
And uh, I'm yelling, take him to the ground, get him to the ground. And finally got on the ground. After the fight, he goes, try, is my nose broken? I go like this. I grab his mouth. Does that hurt? No. Then it ain't broken. <laughs> and then uh, a Brazilian friend of mine, Sergio Bottarelli, was a famous, famous kickboxer in Brazil. He was an FFK world champion, full contact, and uh, got a lot of juice down in Sao Paulo. Because Charlie, your guy Chuck's tough. I want him to come to Brazil to fight Pele. I said, Pele, Pele's a fucking legend. Pele Landy. I said, oh, yeah, this is Chuck's first fight. Figure he'd get an American guy down there for Pele to beat. I go, how much does Pele weigh? He goes, about 175, 76 pounds. I said, well, Chuck will wait. I asked Chuck. He said, yeah, see what you can do. I said, okay, sir. Chuck will weigh 200, 205. And and and, and uh, Pele can weigh 175, 180. And that was the deal. Wow. So I go, well, Chuck, you and Nick got to get visas to go to Brazil. And uh, I couldn't go to that show. I, had, I was you know, working my day job. I couldn't get the time off. So I sent him down there with uh, one kick, Nick. And he beat Pele. Did you ever see that fight? Oh, yeah. So, so at that time, John Hackleman wasn't with him? No. Oh, yeah. It was slow with the kickboxing team, but he had yeah. nothing to do with the MMA thing. Nick's the one okay. who found him with me, and I sent him. Okay. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, um, sure. and it was the most brutal fight you'll ever see. Yeah. They're yeah. yeah, not And that, that, the, Brazil- Miguel, I'd say when, when these Americans would go down to Brazil, like a, a wake up call and a reality would take place yeah. with about 95% of them. And then yeah. there's guys like Chuck Liddell, you know, a guy yeah. that in world war one, that's who you want in a trench with you. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And, and Travis Fulton, I sent him down to Frederico La Pena. He won an eight man tournament for Frederico La Pena and Recife. You were also in that Dan Severn instructional. I, I thought I heard that. your voice in it. Do you remember Richard Hamilton or Mark Densberger? Yeah, Richard Hamilton. He's the one who brought your... art to a lot of the wrestlers, I think. Yep. Yeah. What was your What was your dealings with him? I I never really dealt with him. Good. He's yeah. the one who brought the wrestlers to Art Davy, and, and that's how. Uh, uh, you know, and after the uh, after the uh, Chuck Liddell fight there against Noel Hernandez, I mean Pele. I booked him against Jeremy Horn. That was the last fight I booked for him. I had a disagreement with John Peretti. And I had an offer for Chuck to go to K1. You know, K1 could fight 205, 210 at K1. Because, well, I just want to do MMA. And uh, I was trying to get John Lewis back into the UFC. Into the UFC, because he used to be good friends with Peretti, and they weren't friends anymore. Oh. So he told Chuck Bell, you want to, if you're dealing with Charlie Hanslow, you can't be in the UFC. Okay. Yeah, go go fight in the UFC. They weren't paying any money back then. But we got five thousand dollars US cash in Brazil. In nineteen ninety eight, that was a lot of money. If you got yeah. paid in Brazil, it was cash. But I wanted half the money up front. Yeah. What was the falling out between you and, and John Peretti? Well, that 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 was it. I think it was about about, about John Lewis. And uh, I he, I wanted John Lewis in the UFC and he refused to put him in there and then i don't know what else happened but uh, you know he didn't get along anymore so i went and, and gary goodrich contacted me at the time and said will you manage me and book my fights for a year or so and i did his deal in pride and his first fight in k1 at the same time it could have been chucks what about rangers? Was a big money. that was a six-figure deal wow what about what about was, rangers what about rangers stat rangers stat i needed an alternate he came up to me at the UFC that I, oh, I also co-promoted me and Les Banana. We got 5% of the gate of the UFCs in Mississippi and Louisiana. So uh, we, because I got, we got it approved uh, with uh, Billy Lyons, the boxing commissioner in Mississippi, and T. Land Miller and Larry Berger, who were the commissioners in Louisiana. Uh, Les was a big boxing promoter down there, my partner. And uh, uh, he came up to me after the fight. I want to fight in the UFC. Now here's this guy. He looked all buffed and built like, he was on juice or something. He said, hey, give, me, no, give me an alternate fight. So I booked him in an alternate fight in, in the UFC after that. And he shows up all fat and flabby. <laughs> he was this fucking muscle monster that I met at Casino Magic. I was like, oh, jeez. Yeah. He got knocked out by Mark Kerr. That was a yeah. real first fight. 
Yeah. The knee, the knee to the face. I told him, watch the knee, watch the knee. Boom. He also managed Orlando Wheat. I helped bring him to the UFC too. I had uh, uh, Master Toddy uh, hook up with him. Master Toddy got a hold up of him because I got to put Orlando V because you know Master Toddy was a well-known Muay Thai trainer. And uh, yeah, I felt I was in, I worked his corner that night too. Um, uh, Remco got him. Remco Pardo got him. Remco Pardo, boom, boom. He after that fight, he goes, "I love this sport. I must do this again. I must try this again." You know, he had some fights in Japan and stuff. Boy, he was a great Muay Thai fighter in his day, man. In Europe and at the Lumpini Stadium in Thailand and Bangkok. He's famous middleweight. Did, did you, and we're wrapping up right now. We thank you for your time. But did you have any dealings with the Holland scene? The Dutch no. scene? No. That's but good, but good, but good friends with Boss Boone, though, still. Man, that whole Dutch scene, it's... Uh... Oh, Boss Boone, you know, he owned all the videos. Part of his deal with Mr. Ishii, he wouldn't give them any of the Dutch fighters, Peter Arts and all them guys, because he owned Nico Sports. And part of the deal was he told Ishii, you can't have none of these Dutch fighters unless I get a percent of the videos, ownership. <laughs> and oh. and he, he had no choice because Boss Boone had all the fighters. Yeah, man, like Dirty Bob Schreiber. I mean, there's so much history there, and it's oh, Peter Arts, it's grimy. Oh, oh, the great Peter Arts, yeah. Ernesto, who's my favorite, Gilbert Evel. Yeah, Semi Schultz, Semi Schultz, arguably the greatest K1 guy ever. Wow, oh, true. That yeah. Dutch, Dutch scene is incredible. Charlie er, er, Ernesto, who's was embarrassed when he lost to Bob Sapp. He told me that was the most, that was the most embarrassing day of my life. I wanted yeah. to win the UFC one more time. I can't believe I lost that fight. I can't either. <laughs> and K1. Yeah, K1. Yeah. Charlie, why don't you leave us with some words of wisdom? Words of wisdom. A lot of you young guys are fighting. I know people now that are fighting in events. Make sure you got a good manager and a lawyer to look over your fight contract so that you don't get screwed. Because I know people that are in, I won't mention the, the circuit, but... Um, they're champions and they're not getting paid what they should. You know, I'm not saying they should make a hundred thousand dollars, but you know, when you get nine thousand, ten thousand dollars a fight and get a champion, you'd be getting at least 25, 30, you know, a couple times a year. It's good money. And uh uh but yeah, make sure you have a lawyer, somebody who deals in sports entertainment to read over your contract if your manager's not capable of doing it. Good advice. Wow. And uh there's life and there's life after fighting. Always remember that. Don't just think that this is how you're going to make the living for the rest of your life because it ain't going to happen. Man, that's that's legit. You're living in Vegas for now. Are you still working for the commission? No, I retired from that three years ago, and I retired from the airlines three years ago. I was an inspector for 16 years, but I was still booking fighters, helping guys book fighters and shooto and stuff. And I actually did a seminar. Um, in Australia, before the UFC went down there, Mark Ratner said, uh, you know, I told Mark Ratner, promoter Kelly Seif wants to take me down there and uh, work his event, the XFC. And uh, matter of fact, Danny Cormier was their first champion down there when I did that event. I did a seminar training inspectors. A referee, Chris Tyone, did a seminar training the referees down there and in Australia for the New South Wales Athletic Commission before the UFC went down there. Yeah. Wow. Charlie? You're a man that is, I mean, you were at the cutting edge of a sport that is now mainstream, and you were there when it was a dirty little secret for everybody else at yeah. the forefront. Yeah, it was, it, was, it, it, it was fun. It was uh, thanks to Kevin Rose here. Or I'd just be working, doing my little WKA shows or something. You know? uh, Charlie Sims. Crazy and, and my good friend, Art Davey, you know? Yeah. I was 16 when UFC 3 came on, and I, I distinctly remember you in that jacket, and I remember <laughs> thinking, who, who is this crazy guy? Someday I need to talk to him. So my inner teenager feels very <laughs> appreciated right now. So thank you very much. Oh, that was great. I hope, I hope you enjoyed it. You know, I, I very much enjoyed it, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, there's a... 
It was a crazy time. I've met a lot of people. I'm sure dear friends, Frederico, Frederico Lapenda, Art Davey. I keep in touch with David Isaacs on Facebook. Some of the old old fighters, and uh, and it's it's always we always smile when we see each other. It's like oh, you know, it's like I've been thirty year friendships with some of them. You know, you shared a hell of an experience with them. Yeah. yeah, it was fun, good and bad, but yeah. But at at the end, we all shake hands and say hello, and you know. Yeah, that's good. Anybody that can get us a hold of Harold Howard, anybody, and I, and I should yeah. be in the UFC Hall of Fame as a pioneer. In the I pioneer agree. Division. I agree. That's true. That's First true. Ever even, Mark Rat- even Mark Ratner thought so. Somebody's got to have tell them to nominate me. I got the event approved in its first state. So here, here. life support. I'll call Herb Dean tonight. Hey, hey, that's the best I could do. What about Phyllis Lee? Did you ever deal with Phyllis Lee? No, I sent him to Joel Sutton to paint grace with her. Okay. When he did the big fight over there. She's a nice did, lady. Did, did, did she ever, like, was she generous with, like, maybe kicking back, like, if you got her a good contact? Uh, I never really dealt with her. I just had her put Joel in, 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 in paint okay. and paint grace just to get some experience. Yeah, I heard she drove a hard bargain when it came to uh, making sure she got paid. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Charlie? Absolute legend. Thank you so much. So I appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Joey. Thank you, guys. Great seeing you. Joey Venti. Another legend. We couldn't Mission get Kevin Rozier, but we got Charlie. All right. So we're deep in the UFC, Octo- UFC 1 October right now, even That's though we're right. in September. Right? We're deep yep. in the UFC 1 October. I wanted to air the interviews the way the guys walked out to the cage. But I was outvoted. And you know what? Rightfully so, because Kevin Sh- uh, Ken Shamrock's, his management team, asked us to release it this Monday. Because Perfect. tickets are going right. sale. Well, then that works so out. It worked out. Worked out. So who do we it, got, on t- who do we got the, so far? The big so. shocker of this interview was mm-hmm. that Andy Anderson, owner of the all-nude steakhouse, is best friends with the guy from Lifestyle of the Rich and Famous. How the hell has that happened? Is Robin Leach still alive? I don't know. I don't right. know. So I, I, I was living in Puerto Vallarta, and he came down. I, I mean, they don't have many celebrities there. So, like, right. when he came down, it was like, kind of like a big deal, which I, I didn't understand. And I, I was told that he didn't shower often. Really? And, yes, and he had a hankering for younger women. That's okay. Like, legal, legal, legal women. Right, right. Well, so... He was an old dude. Most women were younger, you know. He still he just wants him in the breeding population. That's all. That's not a grill. That's not a sicko. <laughs> yeah. So uh I'm shocked at the Andy Anderson revelation. I mean, John, I mean, Joey, you and I have always talked about John McCarthy being a rat. We all knew that. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say I knew that. You just kind of silent. I'm along for the ride. I believe you're agreeing, but you know, you're definitely quiet. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a surprise. If I'm trying to get Herb on this show, I can't be talking about his buddy. Yeah, I won't mention that. Yeah, I won't mention that. Yeah, you wow. will. No, 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 I won't. I really won't. I really yeah. won't. Um, it was a good one. So let's see, who do we got in a can so far? We got Zane Frazier. We've got Art Jimerson. We got Charlie. Uh, Taylor Tooley. Taylor Tooley is this Sunday, and we we got Shamrock in the in the books. So, wait, so we got Shamrock, Gerdo, oh, no, Gerd, wait, not Gerdo. We got Shamrock, Anzalone, Zane Frazier, Art Jimerson. So we got yeah. four. And we're going to do a full week of Zane Frazier, correct? Like we yes. got a. Uh, yeah, it's a two parter. Uh, dude, my favorite interview so far is Zane Frazier. Yeah, oh, well, me too. Out of the UFC one guys, Zane Frazier heads and tail. Above right. well, we, but we, we're still yet to do the Taylor Tuli and the Gerard Gordo. Those are both going to be good ones, especially Gordo. Yeah. Oh, dude, I can't wait. I've been begging for Gordo since this podcast started. Yeah, we got lucky with that one. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Good. Well, we hope you guys are enjoying this UFC one. We're trying to capture as many angles as possible. I know there's some repeat questions on some of these interviews, but it's history. We just want as many eyes as possible on what people experienced. So like, share, subscribe. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.